course uh, in radial shockwave therapy. I've worked for 20 years with radial shockwave and already five years with focused shockwave. In our clinics, we see neurological patients and also musculoskeletal orthopedic patients. And shockwave really is a daily tool for us. Um, I have the opportunity to end study and practicing the shockwave therapy at the same time. Yeah, so this is me. Um, I really worked through uh, a lot of um, um, courses to get a better therapist and I would also like you to get acknowledged with the shockwave therapy because it really will change your point of looking at different orthopedic uh, and musculoskeletal problems. Um, it helps therapists making better progress and better results when you are able to put up the right indication and perform a correct uh, shockwave treatment. Okay, so what I'm now presenting is an introductory course as part of what I do as an independent, um, not an employee, but I'm independent really in consultancy. I work for Gymna and then we do Gymna shockwave courses. This is the introductory course. Yes, there are thank you. Enjoy. Yeah, there are also uh, advanced <laughs> on more advanced topics, and um, in advanced courses we discuss um, well proven um, in the research, well proven um, pathologies and indications in specialized. I see there is um, an A missing in specialized. Um, in specialized topics, we discuss specific um, promising indications for an intervention with shockwave therapy. Okay. So, what will our webinar look like? In the first part, we will give you a general introduction uh, where we discuss uh, some history of uh, the development of shockwave, where we discuss the possible way of uh, the interaction of the shockwave in the human body. I'll do a practical demonstration so you know what to look for when you perform a shockwave treatment. Um, I've brought um, someone with me that will be later on will be a patient and then um, will participate in the practical demonstration. In the third part, We'll discuss some treatment parameters of a good shockwave intervention. We discuss the guided therapy system where we make an overview of the pathologies that are appropriate, are proven appropriate for treatment with shockwave, and we discuss some treatment protocols. OK. So what is a shockwave, in fact? Um, yes, is it some kind of magnetism entering the body when you apply it? No, it is not. Is it the kind of electrical current that is entering the body when applying? No, it is not. Is it the kind of vibration that is entering the body and exerting its effects on the human tissue? No, it is not. Shockwave is a totally different physical intervention that does influence is, or is capable of influencing some um, restorative um, functions in human tissue in human cells. First of all, I will shockwave are in fact all around us. They exist in nature. So what I'm trying to do now is to make this abstract thing, this 
actual abstract principle that the shock wave is to make it more concrete and to show that it exists in nature, that it's in fact. This was an example of how it does exist in nature. You saw the little possibility. Of course, that's not what we are going to use with our patients. We are going to use the restorative uh, capacities of a um, correctly administered shockwave intervention. Another example of a presence of uh, shockwaves is made visual over here. You see that at a certain speed limit, um, or at a certain speed, not a limit, at a certain speed, aeroplanes do create shockwaves and some waves inside the medium where they're uh, transferring themselves in. And it's made visual over here by those gray scales. Yeah. Another example is, for instance, when there is a bump explosion, you have preceding of the explosion, you have, and it's also made visual because it does become more and more gray, you see a shock wave preceding um, the explosion. And um, so it's related to a big um, generation of energy and it does transfer into the surrounding medium. And that's important to take into account. Um, the first um, really um, discovery or uh, what people were asking themselves questions about was in World War II when there were soldiers lying into water and at a distance of two, three kilometers, a bump was dropped inside the water and it did explode. And the soldiers lying in the water got severe lung destruction. And, and this, the people uh, were really astonished by it. I didn't know what it was. And then they started looking for this phenomenon. Huh? Another uh, example of um, shock waves, uh, which were only discovered past World War II, um, was the, a German submarine um, having a torpedo on board and firing at an English fregat, and the torpedo did uh, struck the fregat, the fregat stunk, but on board of the submarine, the soldiers, yeah, there were 25 of them, they all died. And last year, they had been given an explanation that because of the explosion of the torpedo, a shock wave was generated and the shock wave did return to the submarine. And because of the construction of the submarine, not being what it is nowadays, all these soldiers got hit by a shock wave and they were killed instantaneously. So at huge energies, at huge intensities, a uh, shockwave has the power of emitting a large amount of energy. How does this look like? Because there's been a lot of studies. How does this look like on, voilà, on um, a, a curve? Eh? How is it generated, the shockwave? So the characteristics is that you have a very steep rise uh, when the shock wave is generated and at milliseconds. And then this is a positive part. And you also have a kind of negative phase into um, the characteristics of a real shock wave. So it can be described. It is a physical um, phenomenon and it can be calculated and as always when there is a discovery of um, potentiality of physical things of electricity whatever you can ask what benefits can there be for mankind and in um, medicinal use especially yeah so Characteristics, steep rise, a high amplitude, and a small tensile wave component. Yeah. I was already 
discussing a little bit about the history of the medical shockwave and I did talk about the discovery of the effect of the shockwaves during World War II and those soldiers lying in the water and the submarine uh, firing a torpedo and having those disastrous effects. Yeah. So in laboratories they started it um, really um, experimenting with this new phenomenon and uh, after doing some uh, extensive um, animal research where they really did surgically put kidney stones inside the kidneys of living animals. So they took some kidney stones out of a sick animal and put it inside the kidneys of uh, a test animal and then they um, experimented if they could destroy the kidney stones by this new discovered um, physical phenomenon, this shockwave. Yeah. And especially um, they were investigating um, the possibility of the transferring um, of the shockwave into biological tissue because this was discovered experimentally by Hazard in a laboratory in um, Germany where an employee did touch a plate the very moment a shockwave did uh, pass through it and he experienced it inside his body. So it was not known that it was possible to transfer a shockwave into human body. And so they started really um, investing in it much more and they invented it, um, the experimental destruction of kidney stones. In this case, the experimental destruction of kidney stones uh, they placed inside an animal's body. Uh, afterwards, yeah, um, the 1980s, yeah, it, there was the first uh, ex um, experimental uh, lithotripsy on humans and also one of the first indications of uh, the use of shockwave was on the non-unions, so fractures that did not heal um, in a spontaneous way were stimulated by an intervention with focused shockwave. Focused shockwave, I will come back on it later, uh, um, was easy to reproduce. Um, yeah. And they needed it, as you can see in this photo, they needed a huge came, uh, chamber to and a bath filled with water to put their um, patient inside and they need a big, big room. Nowadays, those um, devices are much smaller, but still for focused shockwaves, uh, for kidney destruction, it's still um, quite an, um, a device. Yeah? Uh, here you see a, a picture from 1996 of the first radial shockwave, and that's what we are in fact discussing today, the radial shockwave. And it was uh, on the Olympic Games of 1996 in Atlanta that this device was taken with them. Once again, you see it was a burden to take with uh, as a kind of logistics. Nowadays, the device you see is much more uh, friendly to use and to transport. Okay. So uh, that's what we're discussing. Yeah. And afterwards, there came some uh, indications and some um, yeah, further uh, exploration of the technology for cardiology, for wound healing and aesthetics. Um, the first studies on radial shock waves and their um, success on pathologies uh, were gained uh, after 
uh, the for, at first focus shockwaves seem to be beneficial for um, calcifications inside tendons. And in fact, the first uh, orthopedic uh, treatments on calcification tendons were done by urologists using the devices they used for the um, lithotripsy for the destruction of kidney stones. Okay. So since 2010, there is more and more growing evidence for the intervention uh, in musculoskeletal medicine with uh, shockwave. Okay, the generation of a shockwave, the different generation I already discussed. Um, the focus shockwave, I already mentioned the radial shockwaves. So I will go to the slide where we make the comparison. Yeah on the radial and focus shock wave. You see there are different techniques of generating focused and there are two different techniques of generating radial shock wave. The focused shock wave, they differ in their dispersion of uh, their energy inside the body and they go to a precise point inside the body, really focused like a laser beam on a half a square of a half a millimeter. Yeah. Radial shockwave get a dispersion. Yeah. Focus shockwave, and I will really look for the appropriate slide. Yeah. Focused shockwave you see is really penetrating inside the tissue and starts off real and there is no energy loss at the surface. Yeah. The radial shock wave is a lot of energy on the surface, but has a broader range of uh, tissue you can influence at once. Some other uh, differences between the focus and the radial is that um, the focus shock wave really does cost much more than a radial shock wave does. For treatment with radial shockwave, there is no anesthesia needed. In fact, there are some studies proving that the information you get from your patients when not anesthetized helps you performing better, making your intervention much more successful. Now, for uh, focused shockwave, it was recommended to use anesthesia, but um, now the trend is, because it's more painful also, the trend now for focus shockwave is that they don't use anesthesia only for, they just only use it for the treatment of non-unions, because um, the results of treatment when anesthetized were less uh, efficient than uh, without anesthesia. So also in the radial shock wave, it is not needed to guide your treatment or your intervention by ultrasound because the feedback you get from your patient is much more reliable than the image you get from your ultrasound guiding. For focus shock wave, it is still recommended to have an ultrasound guiding intervention. So the target zone in radial shockwave is much bigger and you can hardly miss normally the pathology you want to treat. In focus shockwave, you have to treat very precise because it's easy to miss your target zone. The side effects in radial shockwave are very low. You can have some um, irritation of the skin, you might have some bruising, but it's always temporarily after two, three days, it always uh, passes. And maybe your patient will complain of a little bit pain afterwards, the treatment, but this passes really temporarily. In focus shockwave, this is different because the intensities you are going to use are much higher and then your patient might <clears throat> have more bleedings, might have some 
um, longer lasting after pain. For muscle treatments, radial shockwave is really recommended, uh, especially for the treatment of myofascial pain syndromes, because once again, your treatment area is much larger and when you treat trigger points, you can treat first locally the trigger point, the spot itself, and then more on a general base, the hypertonia of the surrounding muscle fibers. Because once again, of the nature of the focus of the shockwave, of the focus shockwave, it's less appropriate and yeah, it, it's less competitive with radial shockwave. Yeah. For tendon treatments, you can state that um, they are uh, equally um, doing uh, their job. Huh? Um, just knowing that in focus shockwave, you should be careful not to administer too much energy because you might provoke necrosis of the tendon, which in radial shockwave, because of the limited amount of energy, is never possible. Huh? For bone treatment, so then we are also discussing um, delayed unions or non-unions. Uh, for radial shock waves, we do have uh, sufficient um, research proving that for superficial lying bones, there is um, a good reason why to use radial shock waves. For deeper lying um, non-unions, then focused uh, shock wave has still an advantage. And I've read very recently that now there are some experiments going on where they make um, an osteosynthesis of a fracture and do during the operation a focus shock wave treatment on the fracture area so that it is new and trying to start up the healing of this kind of pathologies really already during operation. So also to demonstrate that insights um, are still going on and we're learning more and more and next year we will know more than we know today. Okay. How in radial shock wave is um, the shock wave generated? You have the handpiece and in the handpiece there is I'll show it also. So in this handpiece, there is a tube inside. The handpiece is connected via a cable with a compressor. The compressor blows and will smash the small projectile over here to the applicator. Yeah? And like in this physical principle, you will have a transfer of energy to the applicator and the applicator transferring once again uh, the administered energy into the patient's body. Okay, I will discuss the coupling uh, and the coupling gel later when I do the practical demonstration. So the working um, mechanism that is now a uh, very much consensus about is that you really you are exerting a mechanical stimulus yeah and what is this mechanical stimulus doing so research really shows us that when you administer a mechanical impulse it can generate a chemical reaction inside the body and in a therapy, you administer a certain amount of additional pulses to provoke a reaction, a chemical reaction in the body. So you administer mechanical pressure, mechanical impulses that do generate chemical reactions inside the body. And this helps in um, restoring tissue in a specific way. So this um, mechanism is called mechanotransduction. And in fact, 
as a physiotherapist, when you do um, make your therapist making exercises, you're also using the principle of mechanotransduction. Yeah. You apply a mechanical stimulus, like in eccentric exercising, and this eccentric exercise is a mechanical stimulus provoking chemical reactions inside your tendon, inside the tendon of your body. Okay, it has been well described. Yeah, so a special. Um, form of mechanotransduction is in fact cavitation yeah? and we'll discuss cavitation a little bit further and cavitation is yeah it's said that you can generate cavitation by applying shockwaves because you have this negative um, pressure underneath the x uh, axis and this Cavitation um, really works very locally, provoking the, the effects you desire. So, you, when you look for um, mechanotransduction and you see this is um, a diagram of a simplified um, model, then you really um, influence the cytoskeleton of the cell and thus uh, provoking these effects for regeneration. Yeah, so it's well, 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 well described. I'm going a little bit over time, so I will proceed. And yeah, OK. There's a lot of literature really describing this kind of um, effect on the body. What we now see as um, a photo of one of the first effects described by um, investigators in studying, researching the shockwave. And this is, in fact, um, an example of the neovascularization. So one of the effects of an intervention with um, shockwave is that you create the forming of new blood vessels inside the body, which is beneficial in a healing reaction. Another early published photo is this one, and this is in fact on a microscopical level, the neo-osteogenesis, the forming of new um, cells, of new bone cells for uh, recreating um, or restoring a normal bone structure. More about the cavitation. Yeah, um, cavitation, in fact, means that by applying um, shockwave, you create vacuum holes. Huh? Um, maybe it's better to make this more concrete by um, telling you. Um, comparison with um, the motor of, uh, of a ship where at a certain speed limit, when it goes slowly, you see some turbulence inside the water. And then when speed goes up, you get quite a lot of turbulence. And then when you, the boat really is at maximum speed, those heavy turbulence disappears. So what really does the screw of a boat do is pull inside the water and create vacuum holes yeah? and those vacuum holes they tend to enlarge to become bigger and bigger and then collapse and this collapsing does give energy and impulses all around where this is happening yeah another example of Cavitation is a submarine under the deep in the sea. And when you see, uh, you can imagine from some, some movies, when you see proceeding the, the submarine, you see what is 
thought to be air bubbles at the back of the submarine, but this cannot be air bubbles because this is deep under the sea, there is no air. So what is this crew doing? This crew is really creating uh, vacuum holes, and that's what you see. And then, yeah, this is a lot of vacuum bubbles. At the same time, this is a process of cavitation being generated. And here you see a screw of a boat having created a lot of cavitation, and you really see the power yeah, of this cavitation yeah, because this is really superior, enough superior material, but still you can have this effect on the basis of vacuum bubbles. Huh? And this kind of specific mechanotransduction is really happening when you treat a tendon and you exert a mechanical pressure in the tendon, hoping to provoke um, the right stimulus, the right response of the structures you are treating. Okay. So a shockwave treatment, yeah, uh, causes micro damaging, disruption of cell matrix and decreasing cell viability in a purpose to increase cell metabolism and neovascularization and eventually calcium resorption. I will discuss this later on. Yeah. And then getting some proliferation and tissue remodeling. So remodeling neocollagenesis, the forming of new collagen uh, cells, new collagen fibers, and decreasing pain and increasing function and helping recovery. Okay. Some contraindications, side effects, be careful for spine, head, lungs, large nerves, but those contraindications really apply much more to um, focused shockwave. In radial shockwave, it's, yeah, the head, of course, when you're a careful physiotherapist, you will be um, not too hasty to treat structures in the neighboring of the spine and the head and so on. When you are really familiar with it, and then it's no longer an absolute contraindication, it becomes a relative contraindication. And of course, there are some risk groups. And once again, in children, the open epiphyseal discs um, should be careful. But anyhow, there is a study published indicating that there is no influence at all when you treat an epiphyseal disc with radial shockwave. Yeah? Pregnancy, of course, as a careful therapist, once again, you will be, um, uh, you will not treat in the uh, neighborhood of the abdomen, but a um, pregnant woman with uh, plantar fascia really is an indication for shock. Okay. And then, of course, some medical conditions, and I will uh, emphasize the cortisone use, never treat a tendon within four weeks after a corticoid injection. Yeah? If you want to be more careful than four weeks, wait six weeks, but you can. Yeah? It only becomes uh, when a patient already has been infiltrated with a cortisone, uh, corticoid injection, it becomes much more um, difficult and a therapist has to be a little bit more skilled, but anyhow, you can get to a good result. So, I already discussed the side effects. Yes, your patient might complain of some pain, but this pain really disappears after a few days. So, as an interventional strategy, we like to uh, emphasize um, that, of course, you have to perform a good clinical investigation, that you have to take into account a muscular imbalance, but anyhow, um, in tendinopathies, in um, myofascial pain syndromes, 
Shockwave is a very useful tool and it can really speed up um, your um, recovery of the patient. Okay, so Shockwave is a non-invasive therapy which is safe with almost no side effects. It facilitates natural recovery processes in mostly chronic pathologies. Huh? So in acute pathologies, when there is enough inflammatory reaction, you should, should not put um, shockwave therapy as an indication because the body is still working on recovery and no additional uh, stimulus is needed. And there is a high consensus for the treatment of chronic tendinopathies with an efficiency of almost 80%. So this brings us to uh, the end of part question of part one. Questions is uh, for at the end of the webinar, but I think wait as some questions for you now. Wait, over to you. Okay, let's see if everyone's been paying attention. Okay, so launching the first question. Um, treatment parameters and So the PowerPoint is now loading. Yeah. I mentioned already um, the intensity. I mentioned the number of shocks. Um, and I mentioned the frequency. All three important parameters in a shockwave intervention. So intensity in pain diminishing, there seems, yeah, no, we're not. I saw a pop up um, on my screen, but yeah, it's a, a big, it's a huge, um, it's a heavy PowerPoint, that's why it does take some time. Um, so intensity in pain diminishing, um, that can be a um, linear um, um, comparison that the more you are able to stimulate, the better pain emission can be. Eh? For um, tendon regeneration, however, there is an optimal um, stimulation range. So you should not um, go too much behind or um, over the 2.8 bar, and eh, because the energy you delivered in radio shockwave is expressed in um, in bar. In um, scientific studies, it's mostly in millijoule per square millimeter, but it's an equivalent of energy delivered. So here you do have an overview of the different um, treatment parameters, so the intensity in millijoule per square millimeter or in bar. The treatment duration is the total amount of shocks. As I um, told you, for an appropriate stimulus, it is considered and studies are confirming that for most tendons between 1,500 and 2,000 shocks are enough. However, when there is a tendon, for instance, uh, the Achilles tendon, you can um, discriminate the Achilles tendinopathy um, at the insertion point, then 2,000 shocks are enough. For the main body of the Achilles tendon, 2,000 shocks um, during one treatment is not enough to get good results. The first studies really demonstrated that uh, when you compared insertion tendinopathy of the Achilles tendon with mid portion of the Achilles tendon body, uh, the same number of shocks, the results with the insertion tendinopathy were superior. Yeah? And 
when they doubled the total amount of shocks for the body of the Achilles, 4,000 shocks, then the results became uh, equivalent. Yeah? And the, it is believed that because the neighboring bone, the heel bone, you get some reflection of your shock wave and you in fact get a higher dose locally at this uh, insertion of the tendon. Okay, so depending on literature, um, new insights come and uh, therapists get informed for uh, applying in an adequate way um, the shockwave treatment. Yeah. An important uh, parameter also that is not on the interface of the device is the treatment interval. Yeah. So when treating a tendon, yeah, you should have an interval from seven to ten days because shockwave is described as generating an inflammation-like reaction. So the chemicals that are produced do are very much comparable to the chemicals produced when there is an inflammation. Yeah? And sometimes uh, healing is delayed or healing stops because the chemical processes are not going well enough anymore. And then when you apply shockwave, then you provoke an inflammation-like reaction and you induce the generation of those chemicals in the structures that are um, pathological. Okay, so but when you do this, you should in the treatment of a tendon wait for one week to 10 days because when you really do treat sooner, then you destroy the effect of your previous intervention. Now, for muscle intervention, for treatment of trigger points, you don't have to wait a week or longer before having a next treatment. In the next webinars, we will discuss this much more uh, thorough. Okay, so you see the interface as it is on the device. Huh? And later on, I will use this interface to describe the pathologies you really can treat. Here you see what I um, sort of study, the optimal uh, repair potential. So when you really go above 2.8 bar, the repair potential, it's too much. Yeah, The tendon does not bear it. There is optimal intensity to treat. So once again, for tendons, 2.8 is optimal. You can go until 3, 3.2, but be aware your patients will ask, oh, put it some, put it higher, put it higher, result will be better. No, we have to state it clear. The result will not be better. There is an optimal stimulation. And so it might occur for a patient that at first you want to destroy a calcific depot, you need to have much higher intensity to be able to stimulate the reabsorption process. And then later in the treatment, when calcification has gone, that you have to lower the intensity huh, for having an optimal stimulation. Okay. But, yeah, okay. Yeah, I will pass this a little bit quicker because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. The depth of the treatment area is an important, but I will discuss it when I discuss the applicators. Huh? And also, yeah. Yeah, so it is uh, really um, important that you know that your shockwave is a carrier of energy. Yeah, and that is energy uh, is important for tissue stimulation. So, very, very important is that you use on, on top of your handpiece. Yeah? So, you see those applicators have a penetration possibility from 0 to 40 millimeters, and the dispersion inside 
the tissue will be like this. Yeah. Then there is another application. There are a lot of applicators. Eh? Um, deep impact. When you compare those applicators, they are different. Yeah? The shape is more or less the same, but the deep impact weights less. It has the capacity to penetrate from zero to 60 millimeters. And for instance, for a trigger point in the gluteus medius area, it's important that you have this deep impact applicator to be able to reach at this depth. So it, it asks for a therapist to imagine where in this patient, for instance, a big obese person or a tiny uh, person, you might choose a different applicator depending on where a trigger point is situated. Huh? Tendons are mainly uh, situated superficially. However, in subscapularis or in supraspinatus tendinopathy, I use this uh, deep impact also. And you see it does not broaden that much. It gets less intense, the deep it goes, but the main uh, message you have to remember is that the applicator, uh, depending on the applicator, you get a different dispersion inside the tissue. Okay. And then there are some um, special applicators already for treating fascia problems and for treating spine and so on. Also, there is a possibility of having uh, additional vibration therapy. Um, yeah, and this uh, is called the Viactra. Yeah. The treatment interval, yeah, that's I discussed already that if the interval is too short, that you get cumulative damaging. If the interval is too long, there will be no efficiency or no efficacy of your intervention. OK. Let us talk about um, the software um, and how to uh, how the software helps a physiotherapist to get started really um, quickly but also in an, an efficient and appropriate way so if you see the interface um, you have different buttons and huh? you can um, as an experienced therapist, you will use these parameters and set up your parameters. But on the left, you have a lot of um, um, helping buttons to um, get started and to optimize your interventions. Yeah. Again, play. So what we see here is the button on the left above is a library. In this library are indexed all pathologies where there is sufficient study. So at least one randomized controlled trial giving of a good quality, giving us appropriate treatment parameters. Yeah? And then when you uh, look this pathology, look up this pathology, you will receive the treatment parameters as described by literature. Yeah. Okay. And this library is divided into different subgroups. At first, this library was limited, but now there are quite every tendon in the human body. Yeah. There has been done studies on the use of shockwave, on focused and radial shockwave. And what a therapist gets is a guidance, guidelines, information about most recent um, treatment parameters. So all tendons are grouped together, all muscular problems, so more and more um, yeah, evidence uh, is, proves the yeah, the influence of the beneficial influence of shockwave treatment on myofascial pain. A uh, very recent study emphasizes the use of shockwave uh, superior to exercise therapy 
when you treat the quadratus lumborum muscles. Yeah, whenever they're yeah on bone, eh, I discussed already the bone, um, the possibility of treatment of, for instance, uh, stress fractures, so superficial lying um, bone non-union as a possibility. Connective tissue is a special one. Um, because uh, one of the main indications, um, one of the emerging indications is erectile dysfunction, um, being a um, uh, condition that is really annoying for the patient, but it's connective tissue, and connective tissue is influenced by shockwave. Also, there is the division on neurological pathologies, <clears throat> and um, what is um, emerging or was emerging, but is now quite certain, um, is the beneficial effect of um, an intervention with um, shockwave, radial shockwave, on spasticity. Uh, you should not think immediately as a possibility to treat uh, sh uh, spasticity with uh, shockwave, but we have some <clears throat> systematic reviews, we have some meta reviews of reviews, and really showing this effect. So that's why these are some kind of shortcuts and they don't come in the library unless there is a randomized controlled trial showing the beneficial effect. Okay, it's also possible for a therapist to choose or to start an intervention starting from body area. So we have a shoulder pathology, you click on the button um, and then you get once again um, a presentation of a possible intervention based on the most recent literature. Of course, these are recipes yeah? and like in cooking in a kitchen, a recipe is good, but everyone has to make its own dish of it yeah? and you have to become skilled in the treatment of uh, patients with uh, radial shockwave, and it takes a learning curve. Yeah. So, this system of a patient or a, a therapist getting informed by the device of the most recent literature, of the most recent treatment parameters, that's what we call the guided therapy system. Okay. Um, it lets your patient also um, estimate the kind of pain that is perceived and so on. I will not go too much in detail. Yeah. So you see the visual analog scale, the patient is able, and then you get an algorithm really adjusting intensity because one of the main uh, parameters um, therapist is struggling with is how intense, how much bar can I use? And then you get a correction by the perceived pain of the patient when you use the guided therapy system. Okay, you get also a warning safety restrictions. So you, you get really guided by the intervention. So, um, what kind of treatment protocols are really um, put into this um, guided therapy system? We let us guide with a clinical board. We have eight different therapists with years of experience in the use of radial shockwave. And at first we look at the, what the International Society for Medical Shockwave Treatment does say. And then we only admit level one and level two of um, studies inside our guided therapy system. For instance, um, the Dipritren I see over here is not inside 
the guided therapy system because there is even in 2022 no real randomized controlled trial really explaining or delivering us treatment parameters uh, for being able to put inside the guided therapy system. So, but all other um, yeah, pathologies that really have good studies are uh, put inside software. And there's also the possibility, it is a fact that the software is upgraded every two years and that you get, in fact, a retrograde compatibility. Every therapist using the guided therapy system will be able to receive the software with the new pathologies inside the device. Okay. So I probably should skip this because we're running quite out of time and go to my Correct. It seems um, the wrong or the not adjusted uh, PowerPoint has been loaded. So I will stop sharing this and I will conclude with some home messages. Eh? Um, so my conclusion is that in uh, nearly 20 to 25 years, um, shockwave has been incorporated in the treatment of many musculoskeletal uh, problems with good results. Knowing also that in many studies about tendinopathy, discrimination in the different stages of the tenopathy has not been made in the studies. Still, there are some good results. That's an important remark. Um, it is a safe, non-invasive, easy to apply intervention. Yeah? And of course, um, yeah, knowledge is evolving and we are yeah, hoping that we get even more um, good uh, information um, in the future about next pathologies to be included in the yeah, therapeutic possibilities of um, therapists using shockwave all over the world. Okay, so this is it for me. So uh, I go over to to wait once again, uh, because I have some extra questions, I think, and I will gladly. OK, so yeah, let's leave it there. I just want to thank you so much for joining this first Shockwave webinar. We will, of course, have the second one on the 31st of March, which I believe is going to be more in depth on certain pathologies. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that correct, Bert? Yeah, then we'll discuss uh, tendinopathies more thoroughly. The last question already uh, anticipated more or less on, on the tendinopathy webinar. And, and yeah, maybe there's already something to think about. Uh, and we can have more discussion about uh, um, the, the appropriate intervention. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm gladly share my experience, um, my searching for uh, better interventions, because when I started it, I did not have any um, guidelines. I had to look for them myself. And that's what I did. And I gladly share them with you, my insights, so that you get progression in your approach of your patient much quicker than I did uh, during my career. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bert, and thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a fantastic evening and late afternoon if you are in Perth. 
So, yeah, we'll see you guys on the 31st of March, and I'm hoping all of you can join. And just remember, it is 7 o'clock Sydney time. If you're in Queensland, that would be 6 o'clock. I believe Daylight Savings hasn't quite ended. I think the third one it has. Uh, But, yeah, hopefully see you guys all there, and chat soon.